Our fourth speaker today is Dr. Dan Robinson. He's the director and professor of the School of Education at Colorado State University. Dr. Robinson served as the editor of the Educational Psychology Review since 2006. He's also the incoming associate editor of the Journal of Educational Psychology, and he served as an editorial board member of nine refereed international journals. He's published over 100 research articles, books, and chapters, presented over 100 papers at research conferences, and taught over 100 college courses. His research interests include educational technology innovations that may facilitate learning, team-based approaches to learning, and examining trends in articles published in various educational journals and societies. Now, admittedly, I only met Dan Robinson in person yesterday, but perhaps you'll agree with me that if there ever was going to be a film bio made of his life, I hope Hollywood will have the sense to call upon none other than actor David Morris to play the pivotal role <laughs> of Dr. Dan Robinson. Please join me in welcoming Dan Robinson. I'm going to hold on to this. Well, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm not sure I'm as good looking as David Morse or the guy in the photo that was up before me. I'm sort of uh, an, uh, an unusual character in the, in the mix today. I like the title final speaker, one of the final speakers. That's good. Um, I'm not a cognitive psychology guy. I'm an educational psychology guy. Don't hold that against me. Um, my talk today, <clears throat> And, and I'm sort of cheating because my, my, my title is only about uh, maybe a fifth of my talk. Uh, I'm mainly here to talk about other things. Uh, but I threw in that title just to attract you all and get you to stay. So, um, but I do want to spend a little time at the end talking about how what, what these folks like, like John and Catherine and, and, and the Bjorks uh, and, and Elizabeth uh, and, and Pooja uh, and many others all do in terms of uh, what we'd agree desirable difficulties. Um, sort of marrying that or, or trying to uh, mesh that with, with the cognitive load theory uh, research that's out there that, that you may or may not be familiar with. Why am I interested in cognitive psychology? I had interest as a grad student. Here's one of the uh, early studies I did. I did this in grad school when I was at the University of Nebraska, and I didn't publish it until like, you know, seven years later. Um, and I published it in Memory and Cognition. And I wanted to do a dissertation related to cognitive psych, and I was an ed psych at the time. My advisor, Roger Bruning, said, don't do it, Dan. You're an ed psych guy. You won't get hired in a psych department. You've got a label. And uh, that really stuck with me, you know, really hurt me as a, as a young guy. Um, so I decided to go into ed psych instead. Um, and I also had an early dissatisfaction with education, and uh, I'm going to talk about that dissatisfaction a little bit uh, now. What's our current state of educational research? According to AERA, most of you are familiar with AERA, American Educational Research Association, or as my friend and mentor Joel Levin calls it, the American Educational Opinion Association. <laughs> they should call it AEOA. Let's look at an introduction to the 93 AERA conference by Robert Don Moyer, who is editor of the Educational Researcher. Educational Researcher is sort of the AERA magazine slash journal uh, that's out there. And 1993 was when I got my PhD, so I was just being unleashed on the field. And I know what some of you are thinking, Dan, you must have been only like, what, eight or nine years old at that time? Yes. Um, so this is what uh, Don Moyer wrote. Probably the most radical departures from the status quo can be found in sessions directly addressing this year's theme, the art and science of educational research and practice. In some of these sessions, the notion of art is much more than a metaphor. One session, for example, features a theater piece constructed from students' journal responses to feminist theory. Another session uses movement and dance to represent gender relationships in educational discourse. And another session features a demonstration complete with a violin and piano performance of the results of a mathematician and an educator's interdisciplinary explorations of how music could be used to teach mathematics. Great, sounds like a fun conference, huh? Piano, violin, everything. The next year, in a session at the 94 AERA meeting in New Orleans, two researchers were displaying their wares in a joint presentation. Researcher A, by reading a poem about researcher B, engaged in a professional activity. Researcher B, by displaying a painting of researcher A, similarly engaged. Artistic, yes, but is it research? Imagine the following dialogue. Should the FDA approve the new experimental drug for national distribution? Definitely. 
Its effectiveness has been documented in a poem by one satisfied customer and in a painting by another. <laughs> so this was occurring at the time that I was being unleashed on the field. Educational research. I, I had to get jobs in colleges and schools of education. And uh, this was the type of research that was being lauded at the time, not just lauded, embraced. And I can remember, I was telling a story last night of, of interviewing at a particular university and uh, sharing the results of an experimental study and pretty much being uh, run out of the room because that particular school of education had prided itself as being a constructivist school of education. And some, for some reason, experiments didn't belong with constructivism. So I was really sort of uh, having an identity issue when I first came out and, and figuring out what I was going to do. If the purpose of AERA conferences once was to unearth the greatest research to show, the New Age AERA conferences are fast becoming the greatest show on earth. What we have witnessed is a transformation of AERA conference sessions from presentations of credible evidence based on carefully controlled investigations to presentations of incredible conclusions based on unsubstantiated opinion. Now that's 20 years ago. Certainly that hasn't continued. Certainly that was a fad. We corrected ourselves and we came out of that, right? By the way, this is uh, all written up by uh, Joel Levin and, and Angelo O'Donnell back in their 2000 uh, article. Does this sound crazy? We aren't still doing this in education, right? Here's an article that appeared in the Educational Researcher. This was probably six or seven years ago. And uh, how many of you regularly read Educational Researcher? You members of AERA, anyone? There's no education folks in here? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. The craft, practice, and possibility of poetry in educational research. This article changed the way I viewed uh, the Educational Researcher. I thought maybe it was good fire starting material after that. Um, notice in red there, use of poetry as a means for educational scholarship. Now, I like poetry. Who was with me the other day when we were walking across campus and I promised a poetry reference? Yes. You knew my talk was going to be about poetry. Poetry's great, but is it educational research? Should we be using poetry as an educational research tool? My good friend Joel Levin wrote a response to this, and he wrote it in the form of a poem. And uh, he called it Ode to Cahan, who was the author of this, and it was Ode, O-W-E-D, Ode to Cahan. And uh, for some strange reason, the folks at AERA didn't want to publish it. So when I became editor of Educational Psychology Review, one of the first things I did was I asked Joel to send me that poem, and I published it. <laughs> and I'll share that with you, but it's, it's a good one. Um, but yeah, is this what our field's about? Should we be doing uh, paintings, dance performances, theater pieces? Poetry? Or do we have real problems to solve, like what we're talking about at this symposium? Here's another recent article that appeared in the Educational Researcher. I think this was a year ago. Translating autoethnography across the AERA standards. How many of you know what autoethnography is? Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, autoethnography. So ethnography is a qualitative technique. Autoethnography is what? How is it different? Looking at yourself in the mirror and saying some stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So with autoethnography, the only data point is yourself. You do a study, and the only thing you look at is yourself. So, you know, when I was a kid, they had these things called, like, diaries that they sold, and you would write about what you did every day. I think that's somewhat similar to autoethnography. Only maybe autoethnography is more scientific. But this article was making the argument that we want to look at autoethnographic scholarship as credible and defensible empirical research. And, and no such article has worked to demonstrate this important connection, a real world of promotion and tenure decision making in the academy that hinges increasingly on the integrity of the blind peer review process. Sounds like this person's angry that their autoethnographic research doesn't get published in most journals. Should it? I mean, maybe there is a place for the scholarship out there. But what about solving problems in education? Should we, work, should we look beyond ourselves, perhaps? Here's another one. This is a good friend of mine, Tony Talbert at Baylor University. 
He wrote an autoethnography when he took a sabbatical and went back to the classroom. Uh, a very laudable thing to do, right? He's a teacher ed professor and he goes back to the classroom, spends his sabbatical. I think it's a great thing to do, by the way. But an autoethnography of that experience. We have a lot of students at Colorado State University. I took the job there a year and a half ago and I was reading through all the dissertations and a lot of them were autoethnographies. Now when you have a distance education program that offers a PhD, and you want that student to do a PhD from a distance, an autoethnography is pretty appealing. Because you can basically write about, here's what I experienced this last year. That's your dissertation. So for those of you who thought like, you know, maybe I'll get a PhD in education, perhaps. <laughs> here's a Kelvin and Hobbes. I used to hate writing assignments but now I enjoy them. I realize that the purpose of writing is to inflate weak ideas, obscure poor reasoning, and inhibit clarity. With a little practice, writing can be an intimidating and impenetrable fog. Want to see my book report? The Dynamics of Inner Being and Monological Imperatives in Dick and Jane, a study of in psychic transrelational gender modes. Academia, here I come. <laughs> is that education? Is that the field of education? You know, sometimes uh, a few of us talk about the lack of credibility we have in educational research and, and that we're made fun of. Every year when the AERA program comes out, I always issue a challenge to my friends and I say, take any of the pages, it's, it's, it looks like a phone book by the way, it's, it's huge, it's a huge conference. Take any of the pages where the majority on the page are session titles and find me one page where you can't find at least one title of a talk there that isn't embarrassing if it got out to the general public. Take that challenge. See if you can do it over the last 20 years. I'll bet you can't. Told you I'd throw in a Lauren Resnick quote. Former AERA president, co-director of uh, University of Pittsburgh's LRDC Center. Uh, recently indicated that when it comes to education research nowadays, we often drift into, I'm okay, you're okay, and whatever you say is research is research. That's what we've devolved into in education. That's what we're about. Now, I'm the director of a school of education. I'm an administrator. I've got faculty who conduct research. I've got grad students who conduct research. I'm not pleased with our state of educational research. I wish it would get better. I think that the type of research that's being discussed here is an example of, of what we ought to be doing. But unfortunately, that's not the case in educational research. The folks who are presenting here today What's your experience publishing in educational journals? You're shaking your heads. What do you run into that's most frustrating? How do they, how do they evaluate your work? Do you see real expertise in the reviews when they, you, you, you submit a, a, a manuscript to a journal and the editor sends you back a decision and shows you the reviews? Do you see real expertise in terms of the science of learning? that they really know what's going on? No. And for many years, you folks didn't send stuff to educational journals for that reason. Now, only recently, you're starting to, to, to see your work appear maybe in the Journal of Educational Psychology. I know as editor of Educational Psychology Review, that's one of the things I wanted to change, was to bring back cognitive psychology folks who do educationally relevant work and bring them into our mix so that they can reach the education audience, folks who really need to hear this stuff. There's hardly any educators here. You maybe don't need to hear this as much as educators do. We really need to hear this. But I'm hoping to change that. You know, I'm an incoming associate editor of uh, Journal of Educational Psychology. I know that uh, Steve Graham, the new editor, wants this group to come in. Come in and share your work. Submit more papers. I think we've actually got some people on board now that might give uh, uh, an honest look to your work. Radical constructivism serves as the current exemplar of simplistic extremism, and certain of its devotees exhibit an anti-science bias that, should it prevail, would destroy any hope for progress in education. Anderson, Simon, reference. I'm telling all this to Jeff. We were talking about this last night. What is needed more than a philosophy of education is a science of education. We need an educational science. And, and radical constructivists, socio-constructivists, there's a place out there for you folks, if there's any of you out there. I just don't think that, that that type of approach may be best served to solve problems in terms of how students best learn and what works in the classroom and what works in the, in the live lab in a lecture type scenario. 
in a learning scenario. Rather than giving people attitude questionnaires and observing them, interviewing them, uh, having them mold clay into a shape that uh, reveals their true feeling. Yes, I was on a dissertation committee once that, that did that. Um, the, the person was going to uh, look at the, the uh, amount of discomfort that women were, were feeling and they wanted to have them mold clay into the shape that revealed the, the amount of discomfort. So my point is let's move beyond nonsense and more to, more to science. I borrowed this from, uh, from Bob, and we talked about it last night, but the rest of you need to see this. Much discussion is centered around learning styles that have been brought up repeatedly. Yeah, this is a good one. This, this came from The Onion, is that right? Yeah, a nasal learner struggles with an odorless textbook. That's classic. I mean, once I got that slide, that's in every talk, no matter what I'm talking about. We've got to continue to make fun of the learning style, folks, until they go away. We've got to. We've got to continue to shine a flashlight on them, a high beam, intense light, shine it in their eyes, make them stop talking, make them go away. It's politically correct. It's appealing to everyone. It's an excuse for everyone. The reason why I struggle, but there's no science to back it up. So stop talking about it. And this is the, uh, the study. Um, that looked at uh, learning styles. There's no interaction effects. No interaction effects out there. Stop it. Go away. I got to make fun of my university again. At Colorado State, we have a teaching and learning organization, and they send out this teaching tip about once a month. I just emailed one again last night. Came out yesterday. It was on uh, spatial learning, right? Visual learning. And the recommendation, one of the recommendations was, used colored markers, you know, because that'll appeal to the spatial learners. Don't just use white ones on chalkboard or black ones on whiteboards, but use a variety of colored markers. That way this type of learner will benefit from that type of instruction. So, you know, the people who sell magic markers out there, they should be happy because that will really help. This one was on kinesthetic intelligence, you know, one of the uh, multiple intelligences of Howard Gardner. And some of the uh, recommendations, role-playing or charades. Why do we need a symposium with science of learning when we have good advice like this? <laughs> Colored markers and charades, that's all we need. Why rely on science? But that's what education has, has relied on for too long. And that's why we need a science of learning. Introduction of props. Yes, we need props. So over the last 10 plus years, me and my colleagues have looked at what's been published in our educational research journals. That's why I look old. That's why I look tired, depressed. Where's Waldo? Are you familiar with the Where's Waldo books? Can you, can you find him in that? He might not show up. Oh, he's right here. Where's Waldo? But that's sort of like what it's uh, like to find uh, experimental research in education. It's like finding Waldo. If educational research were our friend, would we decide to do an intervention? Think of how I've characterized educational research as a, as a thing. You know, it's equivalent to an alcoholic, maybe someone who has a violence problem. I think as friends, we should step in, get them in a room, lock the door, and sit down and talk to that thing. Educational intervention and experimental research is disappearing. Uh, we looked at uh, the proportion of research articles that appear in journals over the last 30 years. 30 years ago, in the Journal of Educational Psychology, almost half of the articles were experimental. Not just intervention, they were experimental. That included actual random assignment experiments, looking at interventions. Now it's down to less than 20% and across the field, educational psychology, education in general. It's being replaced by observational research accompanied by recommendations for practice. The field no longer thinks that interventions or experiments are necessary. We can crank out recommendations for practice like using colored markers without doing studies. 
Statistical modeling of observational data is on the rise. And these articles are more likely to contain recommendations than our articles based on observational data that do not use modeling. You familiar with the modeling explosion out there, right? I'm not talking about people running up and down a runway, right? Modeling clothes. I'm talking about statistical modeling, hierarchical linear modeling, multi-level modeling, structural equation modeling, you name it. Well, for some reason, there's people out there that think that big data now which usually translates to some state or district having a data set that's an absolute horrified mess in terms of missing data and, you know, just poor data in general, that we can hire someone to come in and use fancy new modeling techniques and somehow we'll crank out causality out of these existing post hoc databases. And then we can create educational policy based on that causality. That's what we want to do. The federal government in the United States is funding grants for people to come in and mess with these data sets and apply statistical modeling techniques. Do you see anything wrong with that? They're not interested in people doing interventions in the classroom and finding out what actually works. They want us to look at the existing data sets from 10, 20 years ago where they gave out a terrible instrument that has poor reliability and validity and has a ton of missing data. And let's look at that and somehow crank out something that we can use. Let's base our policy on that. Recommendations based on observational data can and are repeated in later articles. In one of our studies, we looked at these recommendations based on non-experimental, non-intervention articles. And when they're cited later on, they repeat the same claim or recommendation for practice around 10% of the time. One of the most depressing studies I ever did was uh, looking at educational textbooks. And, and Elizabeth, I meant to uh, email this to you today, but I couldn't find it. Maybe it's been, you know, torn up. We looked at educational psychology textbooks, uh, um, teaching methods textbooks, and we looked at their recommendations for practice in terms of learning tips, strategies, things like that. And um, they rely on secondary sources. If those were our dissertation students, we would chide them. We wouldn't let them pass because they're using secondary sources to support their work. They can't even find primary sources out there. And rarely are they intervention, 20% of the time or less. All right, that's my, uh, that's my soapbox on, on the state of educational research. How much time do I have left? Do I have five minutes? Awesome, nine minutes. Now I have to talk about something that makes me appear competent. So back to our competing theories, desirable difficulties versus cognitive load theory. Let me just talk a little bit about this. And, and my goal today is um, can we bring in some of the work that's done in cognitive load theory? And would that work in uh, the desirable difficulties paradigm? And can we sort of uh, uh, figure out a way to have these two fit, so to speak? So one of the things that uh, one of my graduate students at Texas, Daniel Clark, looked at was this idea of disfluency. Now, I know none of the folks here today have presented on disfluency as being a, a learning strategy. Um, and actually, it sounds sort of ridiculous. But disfluency is not, we're not talking about disfluency in terms of people not being able to articulate well uh, a foreign language or their own language. But disfluency here means making typeface difficult to read, more difficult to read, so that it enhances learning. And one of the things that Daniel Clark looked at was changing typeface and seeing the resulting effects on learning. Here's his materials that he used from his experiment. He's still trying to get this published, by the way. Oh, by the way, um, you guys mentioned having difficulty publishing your work in education journals. He's having a real difficulty publishing this work in journals. And I think it's just because people don't like it. it it's, it's, it's an intervention that's so simple, but seems so stupid that no one likes it. But look what he did on the bottom. He just blurred the typeface. But in his study, he found that presenting uh, information text in that typeface on the bottom, as opposed to the one on the top, uh, enhanced learning. People did better on tests of comprehension. Now, there's lots of competing theories out there. One is it causes you to slow down. One, it causes you to, to, to concentrate more, things like that. But this is a pretty good example of perhaps a desirable difficulty. Desirable in the sense that it has a desirable outcome 
increased comprehension. What about too much disfluency? Is that possible? Can you have something that's so blurry or so difficult to read that you have to make it better in order to enhance comprehension? Well, that would be the cognitive load theory perspective because cognitive load theory says that there's this extraneous cognitive load out there that's uh, unnecessary and not good for learning. So sometimes you can take instructional materials, make them somewhat more easy, and it enhances learning. So I see a real difference here and perhaps a balance between desirable difficulty and cognitive load theory. Sometimes we need to increase difficulty to Im improve comprehension and learning. Sometimes we need to reduce it. Here's the most common, oh, and by the way, you know, in, in the news a few weeks ago, uh, this one guy was uh, sort of embarrassed because he, he was uh, using Wikipedia sources and, uh, and, and not giving them credit. I think I, I think I stole this from Wikipedia, by the way, just, just admitting up front. Um, this is the most famous of the cognitive load theory uh, effects, the, the worked example. In other words, giving geometry problems, algebra problems, sometimes it's better for students if you work out the example for them first, give them worked examples of how to do the problems before presenting them with problems. Makes sense, that's what we do in math sometimes, correct? Well, this is an example of, of making it easier for them so that they can learn better, right? Reducing that extraneous load. Cognitive load theory also has what's called an expertise re reversal effect. Sometimes worked examples aren't appropriate for all learners. Learners with prior knowledge of the subject find this form of instruction redundant and may suffer the consequences. We actually did a study with uh, my grad students a few years ago where we used computer simulations and we found this expertise re re uh, reversal effect uh, with students who were computer science majors who already knew the material well. They didn't need the feedback. Feedback actually was detrimental in their learning as compared to novices. So there's a balance here that we're, uh, that we're striving for. I have five minutes left, so I'm kind of going on through here. Um, here's one of the studies, first studies I did uh, with graphic organizers. And just to give you an idea of what we did, we gave people uh, text with different types of notes. This is called a graphic organizer. Looks like a chart or matrix. Uh, describes different types of sleep disorders. And then the same information can be displayed as an outline. I know this is really small, you can't see it, but you know what an outline looks like, and then here's what an outline looks like if you make a graphic organizer. Well, in this particular study, we found that graphic organizers like this one were better than outlines, even if you reduce study time. But then we did something kind of unusual. We used a, a testing delay. We waited a while before we tested them. And we found that this advantage reversed. In other words, outlines were better than graphic organizers after a delay. They're more difficult to learn from. <laughs> Out, our, uh, graphic organizers are better immediately, but this, this having to untangle this information actually worked out better after a delay. So I think that's, that, that's possibly an example of a desirable difficulty. Giving students information in a way that they have to somewhat struggle with or wrestle with might actually be good. Here's another optimal effort study that I did with uh, grad student Andy Katayama. Same graphic organized study. We gave him a, a complete one like you saw, or this one, which is partially filled. It has some blanks. The students had to look in the text and complete the information. Okay. Or we gave them uh, a skeletal graphic organizer, completely empty, except for the headings. They had to go through and fill all that out. Well, which one worked best after a delay? It was the partial graphic organizer. So this would suggest that there's a balance, that you want to provide some difficulty, but not too much. You've got to make it somewhat easy, but not too easy. So I think that you know, some of the studies I've been involved with, we're going to see a balance in terms of searching for desirable difficulty versus making things a little bit easier so they're not too onerous for students to do. And how do we reconcile the two theories? That's the question. One of the things I'm trying to do right now is see if we can create an organization that, that, that includes all of the good cognitive psych folks who do education research and bring them into the education world where they haven't been welcomed recently, right? And also bring in the cognitive load theory folks. And I'm excited about that because I think both groups are good scientists, they do good work, and I think we can reconcile some of these dif differences in terms of uh, difficulties versus making things easier. That's it, thank you.